The Borderlands franchise has become well known for its distinctive cel-shaded art design as well as its humor-filled cast of characters. If not for these two standout aspects, Borderlands may have perhaps just become another standard shooter that came out in the late 2000s. But fortunately, due to creative decisions made along the way, its more cartoony look and sense of humor helped it achieve five game titles and even one feature-length movie. But what was Borderlands originally supposed to be? Back before it was a franchise gamers knew, back when it was still in its early stages. Well, that's why I'm here to go over and take a look back at Borderlands before it became what we know now. The characters, the story, the tone, and anything that might give you a little more info on this gaming title. Why have you come here? Only fools and criminals come to this planet. This is a dangerous place. If the bandits don't get you, the wildlife will. You won't last long here. Not without help. Not without guns. A hell of a lot of guns. Why have you come here? You're looking for the vault, aren't you? You won't find it. I'll tell you the same thing I told all those who came before you. It doesn't exist. Before any video game can commence, it first needs a premise. The world, landscape, and overall narrative Gearbox was going for would largely remain untouched. An ancient alien vault attracts all kinds of attention from those seeking fame, power, and money. But three new vault hunters have their own motivation. That's correct, the original concept only involved three vault hunters, Roland, Lilith, and Mordecai, with the exclusion of Brick. From a character design standpoint, Mordecai remains largely unchanged. While in the games Mordecai's initial motivation to search Pandora is simply its treasure, originally in the prototype he was meant to be searching for an old friend. A man by the name of Quinn had died a year prior to Mordecai's arrival, and so he sets out to uncover how he died and what he was carrying. Interestingly enough, based off dialogue between both him and a bandit leader in the game, it alludes to the idea that Mordecai used to be part of the bandits and their clan, but chose to abandon them and adopt a new name and profession as a mercenary. That's still what you call yourself? Mordecai? We have unfinished business, Corrin. His trusty pet Bloodwing may have been prevalent since the beginning of this series, but here he doesn't start out with him. According to his bio, partway through the game, Mordecai befriends an alien creature that will assist him in combat. It's never specified what type of alien creature it would be, but all we do know is that these were the fruits that bore the creation of Bloodwing. Roland went through a much heavier design change. His rough and rugged military design perhaps looked a bit too standard compared to other works of fiction in its field. His skin color was changed and a whole new model was created, which led to the Roland we interact with in the game itself. His original model, however, wouldn't go unused. In fact, he would actually be one of the very first NPCs you interact with in the form of Dr. Zed. While many of the scars and head tattoos would vanish to make him look less like a soldier and more like a doctor, this would serve as the core explanation for Dr. Zed's surprisingly in-shape physique and militaristic build. Roland's story would draw many similarities with the final product, as he still remains a former soldier of the Crimson Lance. While in the game, it's never directly specified why Roland is on Pandora in search of its vault, this bio says he's been working on the planet as a hired gun ever since he left. It's not until a bandit leader whose name bears a striking similarity to a man he's had a vendetta with for over a decade that Roland gets pulled into the story. Roland's initial setup most closely resembles the Borderlands Origins series of comics released back in 2012. To make a long story short, Roland is betrayed by some higher-ups in Atlas, resulting in the death of his entire squad. He swore to get revenge on one man in particular, which very closely aligns with the premise of Borderlands' prototype, though the names of both of these men are different. Lilith was probably the most reworked character in this entire franchise. 
presumably one of the earliest concepts to come to fruition, didn't even have her as a siren at all, if the concept of sirens was even a factor during this stage. Lilith initially started out as a mercenary scientist by the name of Lilith Cashlin. Her bio states that she views traditional humanity with a bit of melancholy for what she has lost and can never have again. Similar to what happened to Roland, the concept design and even the story this time were scrapped for an entirely new idea but both the character model and setup for Dr. Lilith Cashlin would simply go through a name change. This would be the setup and premise for who would become Patricia Tannis. It seems that what may have spurred the redesign of Lilith came from the Siren concept. Adding a bit more magic and mysticism into the world could help it stand out and Lilith could fill the role as a type of mage character. Her new design changed her skin color to a pale white with bright yellow eyes. Her distinctive siren tattoos that we know in modern day are missing, however, come in the form of her eyes. When she begins to use her phase abilities, her eyes change pitch black in a similar way to how her tattoos now glow, signifying their current use. Her story remains almost exactly how it was in the final product, being one of only six sirens in the universe, Cashlin comes to Pandora seeking answers to what she really is. Her design would obviously go through one last change, similar to how her original design became a new character completely in the form of Patricia Tannis. Lilith's second design would do the same. This time Lilith's concept would go on to become the antagonist of the first game under the new name, Commandant Steel. Her final design is what we wound up getting in the final product, as well as getting rid of her last name, Cashlin. Why they chose to abandon the much more mage-like design, I don't know. How the characters met is a much more interesting question. In the dialogue files labeled as The Decision, the characters are determining whether or not to explore Pandora, which presumably is when they first step foot on the planet. The dialogue was obtained by Trombonerist. Link to the video will be in the description. This is my ship. But this is not what you signed on for. So let's hear it. I'm going to Pandora. Okay, that's one vote. I wasn't voting. You're leaving us? Up to you. I'm going. As am I. You understand the repercussions. I understand everything. A vault of advanced alien technology and undiscovered riches. Of course you're going. What about you, Roland? You in? The line we walk between legal and profitable can be blurry. This will put us far beyond simply bending the law. We're talking about hijacking the largest transport ship in the galaxy and flying it to the outermost frontier of space where we will presumably dump it like scrap so we can go treasure hunting. Pretty much. If we get caught, I'm saying Cashlin forced me to do it with her mind powers. Good call. Works for me. Oh, very funny. We're not laughing. All right, let's do this. Riken, we're in. Of course you are, dear. This one is just too good to pass up. Riken. Yes? Screw us over? and we'll end you. I can live with that. All right, boys, let's fly. The two characters named Riken and Salix never made it to the final product. And interestingly enough, it seems that Roland, Mordecai, and Lilith were all traveling together on this cargo ship. Unlike Marcus's bus, the ship is under some company's control. It's not until the characters illegally hijack it that they seem to be able to explore Pandora in search of its vault. And this is presumably where they eventually meet with Helena Pierce in New Haven. As far as the story continues to go, the main antagonist of the prototype is Steel. The name would eventually go on to be used for the main antagonist in the official release, before Lilith's design was taken to serve as the antagonist. Steel was the prominent bandit lord in the prototype for this game. With a much more Mad Max-esque design, as well as being a man, Steel seems to have originated as the first real boss you faced entering the world of Pandora. Based off the few lines recorded during this demo, Helena Pierce was the most prominent character who guided you on your journey. Being the unofficial mayor of New Haven, the town has actually made a truce with Steel's brigadiers. Though being a bandit, they don't often adhere to their truce. It's a stalemate, but we call it a truce. A stalemate is futility. A truce, a truce is hope. When New Haven begins experiencing new troubles in the form of Rax and its Rack Hive, Helena sends Roland, Mordecai, and Lilith out to Steel's camp to steal explosives. Somewhere nearby, these things, these Rack, must have a nest or a hive. We need your team to find it. Find it, destroy it, kill the Rack, and will pay. The prototype doesn't go too much farther than the death of Steel and the intention of taking down the Rack Hive. 
Many notable characters, however, still seem to have made their way into the prototype, including the likes of Scooter, Marcus, and TK Baja, though they're never seen. Some more interesting details found in the unused dialogue are references and concepts that weren't used in the final release, but rather ended up being saved for future installments. Helena Pierce and New Haven are in contact with another safe facility called Sanctuary. They aren't gonna answer. Sure, but we're too far. You're stuck in the flats, and New Haven is a bit thin on manpower. No offense, New Haven, if you're listening. <laughs> I'll bet. Sounds good to me. Sanctuary out. Another piece of unique dialogue which found its way into the story was a passerby's warning of the Skag Pearl. If you get lucky and you manage to kill a Skag Alpha, do yourself a favor. Leave the Pearl Stone. Every Skag in ten miles will smell it. They can smell them through time and across dimensions. They'll hunt it down and kill anything to get it. So don't get tempted. Leave the thing in the dust. In Borderlands 2, it was revealed that Helena's scars on her face were the result of her husband gifting her one. My husband gave me a Skag Pearl Ring. The Pearl released hunger-inducing pheromones. However, we don't know if that's how it was always intended on being planned. The earlier trailers of the game allude to some interaction with the Vault that led to this injury, but despite the overall narrative of the world and characters, the Borderlands prototype was still very light-hearted. Comedy was thrown in with many of the NPCs, and Vault Hunters too made witty statements relevant to their actions. The overall aesthetic and environment of the game wasn't quite reflective of the product Gearbox had made, and so they sought to add a more cartoony feel to the overall experience. By doing this, the final product doesn't look like a product of its time. Rather, its unique design helped it stand out, making what the inevitable release would become a classic. While many concepts would remain, it's neat to see not only what made the final cut, but also who the original Vault Hunters may have been. But anyway guys, I just wanted to make a video all about Borderlands' prototype, the game we almost got. If there are any other interesting facts regarding its stages or storyline, then be sure to leave them down in the comments below. And if there are any other specific Borderlands related topics you'd like me to discuss, then let me know as well. But until next time, I'll see you in the next video.